So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to divide the teaching up over the day so it's not a whole load at once. Um, so I think I'll, I'll speak a little bit more now um, before we meditate some more. Um, let's uh, pick up a little bit where we left off. So inner critic is quite familiar territory and maybe even some, at least some of what I suggested earlier would be, as a possibility, would, would be familiar to some of you. And that way of sort of engaging in the dialogue with a person or figure in the psyche is somewhat familiar for some of you. Um, but I say, let's take it, let's take it, uh, explore further possibilities. So, uh, still with the inner critic, in fact. Um, <coughs> this is some years ago now. Um, uh, a man was also on retreat at Guy House and um, came in and said, was again reporting in the critic. And he says, it's like the, the voice just says, you, you, it, whatever I do, I'm never good enough. Uh, and there's always this judging. This is the usual stuff. He was quite used to it. Uh, and so we talked about different possibilities, so, and the possibility of exploring, uh, exploring it, turning towards it, and engaging in relationship with this figure. Um, and what? I, so he went away and did that, and came back and reported that um, images of his parents came up. Uh, but then he said, actually, if I'm really honest. They look like my parents, but they're not my parents. And he said, my parents were much kinder than that. Uh, now, again, we're not talking about denial. This person was, had, you know, worked through stuff with their childhood, etc. Um, these are, if you say, if you like to say, the realities of the psyche. These images or realities of those psychic realities, so to speak. We, at least in what I'm presenting today, we want to be very careful not to literalize. They look like that. They are not my parents in this case. So I'll say more about this non-literalizing and non-reducing. They are this. So not literalizing, not reducing, but actually engaging them as if they were people, as if they were persons with, with uh, all that that involves. And coupled with that, in, in, in the practice, and using his sensitivity, we talked about it, using his sensitivity to the emotional responses that were coming up for him in relationship to them as he meditated in this way. And they, I mean, they were mostly things like, I'm fed up with this and I'm angry in, in response to it. Working this way, with the, with the sense of respect, not literalizing, not reducing, the sensitivity to the emotionality, what happened is these two figures opened up. It's like they split and became a whole cast of characters, a whole uh, what's the word? pantheon, um, a whole host of persons o opened up. And I can't remember, and he, he sort of gave them all different uh, names, if you like, and times, but I, all I remember is a few of them. And there was the, the good boy. Um, I think he had a naughty boy. He had a frightened boy. Um, he had a hero figure, and he had... a uh, a bad guy who, interestingly, he uh, first at thought, thought at first was evil. So this is evil, and uh, but then he said, actually, looking again, no, no, it's not evil. It's more. Um, and this is really important. It's more like an actor in a theatre. It's more like a style of existence. It's a style of personifying. It's not actually evil. That's quite important because sometimes the reason I'm mentioning that is sometimes with this kind of work. Uh, a person worries about things like evil. I get. I'll talk more about this afternoon. So two things are really helpful. Uh, two two uh, aspects. One is mindfulness. Mindfulness with an image. So what is it to engage an image mindfully? I'm aware. I'm aware of all the responses and, and all the feelings. And so I, I'm aware. And secondly seeing it as an image. This is an image, so it has a more poetic quality rather than a literal quality. I'm uh, aware that this is, uh, if you like, expressing something <coughs> yeah, as a poetic truth more than a literal truth. So mindfulness with the image and seeing image as image, both of those create a kind of safety when there can be sometimes some worry with this kind of area. 
But more than that, they do something really interesting. Seeing an image as image and mindfulness with the image, they empower these images, these persons of the psyche, in certain ways. They give them power and life. They vivify them. And they, at the same time, disempower them, so that we're not in danger of them uh, being acted out unconsciously. So there's an empowerment, at the same time there's a kind of disempowerment. All that's coming through is the mindfulness and, and the awareness. This is image, it's poetry, it's not literal. Yeah? Now, what he found, as um, he did this over, over a few, uh, a little time, and what he found, and I, I would say what almost I would expect people to find, and a few things. The more persons there were in this inner theater, if you want to call it that, the more persons there were, and the more alive they became, the less the inner critic. The more persons, less inner critic. There was a direct correspondence. What seemed like one oppressive thing then became two, then became many, and the whole sense of oppression just went out, out of the whole, di- the whole dynamic. So I would expect that for a start. It's like when the self is singular, conceived as singular, you'll get the inner critic. You'll tend to get the inner critic. You understand? The more we tend to conceive of the self as singular, of course we do in our culture, that tends to constellate something else. The more plural, if you like, and fragmented the self, the less the inquiry. Interesting. So that's one thing. The second thing is, he, he said, and again, this is what I would expect, it's like, through doing this, he disidentified from his usual sense of self. So the usual sense of me sort of uh, was not where his identity was. It opened. And he said, looking at all these characters, he said, they're all me and they're all not me. But the usual sense of self was opened out, uh, gone beyond. In the plurality that opened, me was realized to be bigger than I thought, more, more interesting, more dynamic, more fragmented, more plural. So this way of working what I would expect is one way of, um, if you like, loosening and undermining the belief in this inner solid self. And this is going back right to the beginning, talk about the, the belief in, in the solid self and how <coughs> Buddhism and other traditions see that as a problem. This belief in a solid self. This is one alternative way of actually loosening and undermining that belief. We could, as alternatives, see the emptiness of this solid self. That's what most Buddhism tries to teach, and to some degrees. And so there's different levels of that. So even seeing the process of the aggregates is a certain way of loosening and undermining the the solidity itself, to a certain extent. In in that way, we're kind of deconstructing the solidity itself and just seeing elements and process. So that would be one way, loosening and undermining the, the belief in the solid self. Another way that can open for meditators in these traditions or other traditions is a more kind of mystical dissolution. Meditating different practices or in nature or music or some, something else. The self dissolves. It feels like the self dissolves maybe into a kind of oceanic sense of love, a cosmic sense of love pervading the, the entire universe. The fabric of being is love, or the fabric of being is a kind of oneness there. So these are mystical openings available for people committed to meditation, quite common, actually. Um, So either there's a kind of deconstruction, seeing the emptiness, or there's a kind of mystical dissolution. Those are both probably more standard ways of loosening and undermining the belief in the solid self. But there's also this other way that we're talking about today, this engaging of the psychic characters. All those three are ways of looking, helpful ways of looking. None of them are ultimately true. This is not true that the self is a process of aggregate, and it's not ultimately true that the fabric of things is love. Very, very helpful, uh, a, a very deep degree of of relative truth, but not the ultimate truth. So none of them are ultimate, ultimate truth. All of them are ways of looking. And he also reported this this man also reported that, in his words, he was 
able then to access um, qualities or energies that were previously inaccessible to him. Aspects of being that were previously inaccessible, inaccessible to him, unavailable to him. And again, I would expect that more from this way of working than from the others. Because we're not just deconstructing the self, we're empowering, as I said, vivifying these persons and these figures, these daemons, if you know the word, D-A-E-M-O-N-S. We're empowering them, different than de- just deconstructing. Okay, so so far we just talked about, or gone in with the example of the inner critic, that most people are familiar with saying, oh, you can work in different ways, and there's this. Uh, this other way of working is possible. But sometimes uh, images come up for people that have nothing to do with the inner critic. Their origin is not in the inner critic. So a woman was on the tree and um, she had this figure of, she called him grandpa. It wasn't her grandpa, it wasn't anything like her, either of her grandpas. Um, but he was in an armchair, a kind of rocking chair, and he would hold her and comfort her, and she would talk to him, and there was a dialogue, and there was care, a mutual flow of love back and forth. This became an enormous resource for her, something she could access in, in the meditation. Okay, so that's all very nice uh, resource that's possible. Another woman, uh, also again on the street, and uh, quite a different flavor of image uh, possible. So she was practicing, and suddenly, her words, this huge voodoo guy appeared in front of her and plunged his hand into her chest, ripped out her heart, and bit into it, devoured it right there. And she said, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so what did it show? It was great. Uh, she can't figure it out. What does it mean? Where does it come from? I don't know. It just something about it feels wonderful and right. I don't understand. Uh, quite a dramatic image, or again, quite a dramatic one. A woman was sitting. This is this is years ago now, actually. Many many of you know, I just remember it because it's so vivid. Um, she was on, on a long retreat at Guy House and actually struggling quite a lot with the retreat form and loneliness and silence and and and, uh, and that kind of thing. And there was a lot of loneliness, there was a lot of yearning. And she was sitting, I think, in the lounge at Guy House, if you know, some of those armchairs sort of looking out the window. And she was just sitting there. And suddenly, uh, her words again, uh, a naked golden goddess appeared in front of her and leapt on her, uh, and with a very sort of erotic kind of flavor to it, and started kissing her. Uh, and that kissing turned into that she was then suckling at the breast of this goddess. And she said it was like drinking nectar, like this deep sense of some kind of divine nourishment was flowing into her being. Uh, this surprised her enormously. She'd never <laughs> this before. But she kind of went with it. Um, very deep nourishment, then turned into quite profound bliss. Um, and this huge sense of love opened up. You know, kind of cosmic love opened up. And yes, it did something to heal the loneliness, definitely did, but even more than that, it opened something in the being. Something for her in her soul, if you like, was open, but even more than that, something for her, <coughs> just her vision, her sense, her conceptual framework of what practice is, and what she was, and what wanted to come through. Something was open in relation to what wanted to come through. So people, as like that uh, gentleman with the inner critic, have many, many uh, images or characters uh, come. Um, there was a while ago, a few, few years ago, in fact, I used to get this dragon. This years ago, Nelson Mandela died. And uh, it, it touched me so deeply, you know, thinking about his life and what he did. But, but there's a kind of mythos there. He, he's, he's become, for me, as I'm sure for many, of you, for many, many people in this world, he's, be, he's a mythic figure. You understand? Mm. He, and, and that's not, oh, that's rubbish fabrication. We need that. The heart needs to throw out and color and inject life and mythos into persons and things, etc. Because, because, because we need it. There's something important there. There's something that comes through uh, from doing that. So Nelson Mandela is like that. Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix, 
same sense something's going on there, at least in the way I see it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Einstein. Albert Einstein, again, so, and maybe it's just me, but there's something almost mythic about him and, and uh, the way he was and, and uh, the whole uh, being there and the person, the image, the image. Now, some people, um, also teachers, you have a close relationship with a teacher. So I'm aware as a teacher that I I'm, I'm, have imagistic resonances for the student and there's a close, alive relationship. And that's good and it's important and it's alive and it's rich and it's beautiful. This needs care. But, you know, it's interesting in the realm of teaching, so we tend, maybe not so much today, but we tend to teach um, this style with, with a sort of, what would you say, it's, it's got a, a lot of affinities with the mothering archetype. Like there's a lot of holding and gentleness. It's lovely, very important, maybe, for this culture. Th- this tradition has, has a lot of its roots in um, the Thai forest tradition of the 20th century. And the uh, sort of fathers of that tradition, Ajahn Moon and Ajahn Mahabua, these were fierce, uh, fearsome teachers. Their, their style is the warrior. It's not the mother at all. So you, you see them expressing a different kind of archetypal person coming through. And when they talk about teaching, it's in the language of war and battle. We're battling the defilements, the kilesas of greed, hatred, and uh, delusion. And, and that's the language. That's the, the, the mythos that's, uh, that's there. And they exist, again, as almost iconic images, potentially, for us. So the images are everywhere. We, we see them. We also, and sometimes we don't realize this, that our life also expresses images. We ourselves express uh, persons. There are some mythic style is coming through us, and oftentimes we don't see that. And and then some of what may want to come through, or who may want to come through, may well not fit in to the image, the fantasy, the box that I have of the Buddha Dharma. And I think that that's what Buddha Dharma looks like, or should make you look like. And then this other thing seems to keep wanting to come through. This person who has so many years of practicing and listening to teachings and hearing what they're supposed to cultivate and somehow can't quite let go of the partying and the chasing of the highs and the romances and the this and the that and the surfing and where's the next great wave and thinks and the, the inner critic very easily comes in it doesn't fit the picture it doesn't fit the image the image coming through the person coming through does not fit the image of the dharma a little while ago uh, in an interview <coughs> A woman told me, and I knew her fairly well at this point, uh, and she told me of something that happened, uh, occurred decades before, while she was a young woman, I I don't know, in her maybe very late teens or early 20s. She was traveling in Spain with uh, uh, a girlfriend. They were young and traveling, and they ran out of money. And what are we going to do? And they started... Uh, spending the night with men for money. Uh, first it was just a one-off, just to get money. And then they repeated it. And then it just went on, and it went on. And it, and it kept going for a while. Finally, uh, one man who spent the night with them, uh, they were talking, and he found out what was going on, and he very kindly drove them to both of them and put them on a plane back. And she was telling me this, and there was a, this is decades before, and there's a lot of shame for her around it. And I was listening, and I was, I was listening, and I did know her quite well enough. And I was listening, and I kept, these words kept coming into my, my mind, sacred prostitute. It's like, I can't say that. <laughs> um, and it kept coming, and then finally, sort of tentatively, I put it out there, and it really resonated for her. It, it really, uh, it's almost it recasts the story, the stories that we have of our life. They are not fixed. There's different perspective. What's coming through? What is it that's speaking through me? What is it that's acting through me, pulling me, pushing me? 
Now, she, that really, really resonated and it opened up the whole thing mm. in a very different way, that there was not the shame, very different relationship with it. And it continues to be something that she relates to in a very beautiful way. So I wasn't sitting there thinking, I wonder how I could uh, spin this so she feels a bit better and less ashamed. It wasn't an intellect, it was something that was a lie, that was already, so to speak, in, in the field, if you use the language. The thing was, she was young and she wasn't conscious of this. She wasn't conscious of what it was, of the power and actually the beauty and the, the bigness, the largeness, the magnificence of what was coming through. She didn't know how to handle that. She didn't know how to relate to it. And most importantly, and really want to emphasize this today, she didn't realize that what is an image or what comes and knocks on our door, a uh, person or this demon, daimon, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily acted on literally, taken literally, or acted on. You understand? An image is an image, what I said before. It doesn't mean that it's literal or that it needs acting on. It's a metaphorical, theatrical relationship with this. Do you, you understand? It's different. It opens up space. So but she, she was young. She didn't understand that. So... All these images, they're everywhere. These images are everywhere. These persons can be seen, felt, uh, e everywhere. And then the question might become, what images, what fantasies are there in my life? What, what, what are already there? And which ones speak to me? Which ones are knocking on my door, asking for something, demanding something, pushing <coughs> me, directing me, turning things in a certain direction? So that becomes... Uh, a question that we might ask. And all of this, uh, what we're getting into, starts to suggest uh, practice possibilities, possibilities for practice. So, uh, that's the key word, practice, meaning what is it to bring <coughs> mindfulness to this area, or these possibilities, to really be there and explore relating, seeing with a lot of sensitivity, uh, aware of the resonances, the emotional, the resonances of meaning, aware of how the body feels. You know, when we did that breath meditation before, and working in this kind of, what I call the, the, the subtle or the body or the energy body, it's like that, this feeling here, this space reflects a lot emotionally, energetically, etc. Can I be in relationship with an image or whatever, and be sensitive to this. Bring the mindfulness and sensitivity here and feel feel the resonances, feel uh, what's reflected and what feels helpful, etc. So you use this. This is my instrument. I'm using that. And maybe there's a dialogue. It doesn't have to be, but maybe that's part of it, that one, one engages in a dialogue uh, with, with, with the being. So it could be, in, like in some of these examples, that something arises spontaneously, uh, unexpected. Um, it could be that a lot of the, what seems like flotsam and jetsam flowing through the mind is actually something quite important, maybe, in meditation. So it can arise spontaneously, or you could do it more deliberately. You know, maybe you had a dream last night, and there was some character in the dream that seemed charged or touched you or seemed troublesome or, or something. And bring that dream image, that dream character into the meditation and start engaging, start relating with this mindfulness, with this sensitivity. You can look at that person and feel uh, the resonances, feel their qualities, feel them out. You can also uh, sometimes, um, so to speak, feel them looking at you. Feel how they look at you. There's a relationship here. Sometimes it's even possible to enter into them and feel as if you become them to a certain extent. Sometimes if you just hold their eyes, uh, if it's visual, and you, you look into their eyes and, and the expression in their eyes, you can actually enter and then see yourself through their eyes. Or you can feel in, in your subtle body space their movement or their body, and, and that can also have a feeling of inhabiting, uh, create a feeling of inhabiting. Sometimes this is a very weird one. If you 
put your attention on where their back backbone is down here, you can also somehow enter them. I don't know why that works. So there's a, there's a possibility for relating in different ways and really bringing a, a real sensitivity there uh, to the resonances. I will say one thing. Um, I notice, and other people notice too, that when, when we're quite upset about something, it's as if there's a lot of energy in, in the emotional upset. And that energy in the emotional upset can be enough to constellate, to throw up an image. It's as if that there's energy there that can condense an image. Do you see what I mean? So when we're quite upset, we might think, oh, it's hopeless to meditate. Actually, the, right there is the energy that we need. It's the, cre- it's the raw creative energy that can, that can spin, uh, conjure an image. At the other end of the extreme, when, <coughs> when we're really quite settled and the, the mind and the body are quite unified and harmonized in what we call a state of samadhi, um, everything becomes quite open. And you can come a little bit out of that state and things are very... Um, insubstantial, very fluid, very malleable, and that's also quite a good uh, space to work in this way. The middle territory is a little more difficult. I mean, I, I'm not particularly upset, but nor am I particularly unified and harmonized in some samadhi, and it doesn't tend to generate that much. Still, want, there are possibilities. So there are many, many possibilities. Let's stop, let's stop there for now. Uh, that's enough talking.